Perfect. So my name is, oh, I didn't hear the tone about like recording started. Has it started, Sam? It looks, I think it has for me. It says for me. Okay, yes, it's a recording in progress. Yes. Oh, amazing. Perfect. Perfect. So my name is uh, Dr. Muhammad Ali Chaudhary. And I am an adolescent addiction medicine fellow at the Division of Addiction Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital. And this happens to be the only adolescent addiction medicine program uh, program across the U.S. Um, and today we'll be talking about cannabis use and vaping in teenagers. In terms of disclosures, I have no relevant financial disclosures with regards to the content of this presentation. And our objectives for today collectively would be to understand what addiction is, how does the brain develop, and how the development of the brain makes teenagers particularly vulnerable to substance use. And then we learn about what cannabis is and how does it impact the, the developing brain. Uh, we learn about a common question that we hear a lot is vaping safer than smoking? And what impact does it have on the health of a teenager? And I keep on saying teenager again and again because, because I think that's the age group that we are trying to target in today's presentation. And how do I know that my kid has cannabis or uh, like a cannabis or a vaping problem. And if I do find out, what can I do about it? So these are the objectives for today. So we'll start off with what addiction really is. And ASAM or ASAM is the American Society of uh, Addiction Medicine. And they have defined addiction. And there is some historical context to this definition. So they wanted to dispel all the stigma around it and they wanted to present it as the disease that it is, as opposed to the, the stereotypes that we associate uh, with, with it. So it's a treatable chronic medical disease. So when you think about chronic medical disease, you think about hypertension, you think about diabetes, but it involves a complex interaction among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and the individual's life experiences. And this is very important what they say here because like, you know, we, we try to put it off, we, we try to just say that it's, it's their choice. It's their choice and they made bad choices. But it is not just the choice part. There is the brain circuit that's involved in it, like uh, especially early childhood experiences. They, they definitely impact this. Genetics, uh, so if you have a family history, that impacts it. The environment, so where you are raised, where you go to school, um, who you hang out with, all these things impact that. And then uh, the individual's life experiences definitely do uh, uh, contribute to that. And then finally, explaining what addiction really is. People with addiction use uh, addiction use of substances. Um, uh, people with addiction they use substances or engage in behavior. So it can it can be a substance use disorder or it can be a behavioral disorder. They they engage with these substances or in such behaviors in a manner that is compulsive, in which they don't have control over it. And they often do it despite having harmful consequences. And these harmful consequences can be legal health-related, financial. So, so that's how ASAM comprehensively defines addiction. So the ground rules for today's presentation are there, are no, there is no drug abuse, there is substance use disorder, and there is addiction. There are no abusers, addicts, junkies, or alcoholics, but people with substance use disorder because it's a chronic disease. Uh, you cannot be clean or dirty because clean and dirty are terms that you use for if your clothes are soiled or not, right? Or your yourself is soiled or not. This is not 
these are not the terms that we should be using to stigmatize uh, people with substance use disorder. So if you want to say someone's clean, you can say they have been abstinent and not using or have a negative drug test. If someone's still using, you can say they are active users or they have a positive drug test. And um, one term that you guys probably would not know about is like addicted babies, which is like, you know, for babies who are born to mothers who have, uh, uh, who had substance use disorder and who use substances during, uh, um, um, during pregnancy. So we actually, there's a term for that. It's called neonatal abstinence syndrome, right? And uh, finally, they used to use the term medication assisted therapy or MAT for medications that we use to treat addiction. But then that itself was a stigmatizing term because it meant that we are using some medication to assist in the treatment of addiction. So, so treatment is something else, but we're just using the medications to assist that. But that's not true, actually. Medications are a very prime part of the treatment of addiction. And that's why the term has now been changed to medications for addiction treatment. So those are some of the, 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 the language things that we... we uh, um, we now have rejected that the, the ones on the left and the ones that we use are on the right. In terms of brain development, now let's do a crash course on brain development. So this chart shows you the blue bars are males and the red bars are females. On your horizontal axis or the X axis, you have the age. So it starts from newborn, which is zero up until uh, into late 80s. And then the y-axis or the vertical axis, uh, it's the brain weight. And if you look at it, you will see a trend of growth in the brain weight. If you can see my pointer here. And then the maximum weight the brain achieves is at around 10 to 12 years of age. So it used to be thought that you peak at 10 to 12 years, in terms of your brain capacity? Does anyone think they peaked, at their, peaked when they were 10 or 12? Probably not, right? So, um, and I'm so sorry, I can't see you folks very much. So I, I, I really have no uh, like concept of like reactions from anyone. But uh, if anyone wants to speak out, that's fine with me. But then, but then neurobiology actually evolved a little. We started to look at neurons. And then we, when we look at neurons, we see three phases here. So we have the neurons that are at birth. You see the, the, the central, like, you know, uh, thick part is the neuron itself. And the long tails are basically uh, uh, axons and dendrites, which are small little out, uh, um, um, uh, outreaches of, of, of a neuron. It's, a, it's the way that the neuron connects with other neurons. So if you see at birth, there's very little connection between neurons. At six years of age, we have the most amount of connections. There's connections everywhere. And then at the age of 40, what happens right there? We have less connections than we had at six. So did we regress from six to 14? That can't be true, right? But what happens is a six-year-old's brain is not built for efficiency, but it's built for learning. It has all the possible connections, the useful ones, the useless ones, because it's trying to figure out. So every experience they have, it actually rings one of these connections. If it's a positive experience, it strengthens that connection. If they have a negative experience, it, it, it weakens that connection. So by the age of 40, now the brain is more geared towards efficiency and less geared towards learning more, like learning easily, let's just say that. And that's why it's very easy for young children to learn new languages as compared to teenagers to learn new languages. And then neuroscience actually developed even further and we started to get uh, um, PET MRIs. So basically, this is the scan of the brain, and it shows from the ages five to the ages 20, 
and it shows the development of brain as it happens. And the cooler colors means maturation of brain and the warmer colors means more activity, which means these parts of the brain are still developing. Uh, so you can see in this that the brain does not diffusely develop. It's not like all parts of the brain are all growing all together. You see that certain parts of the brain are mature even when you're five years old, right? But then certain parts of the brain, they mature, they start maturing a little later on. And the part of the brain that's not completely mature up until the very end is this part of the brain. Hey, can everyone see my pointer? Someone say they can see my pointer? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. Yes. Perfect. So, so this is the part of the brain that's de that develops the latest. It's like 20 years of age now, right? And this part of the brain is called the prefrontal cortex. And that's the executive part of the brain that actually makes decisions based on like risk analysis, right? So, and that's why we see all these different phases in from starting from childhood up until adulthood. So the cerebellum was a part of the brain that was actually mature, that, that matured the, the earliest. And that's the part of the brain that deals with coordination. So that's why you see that toddlers uh, start walking. Um, uh, actually, like, you know, when, when they're one year old, they start walking with a waddling gait. And by the age of two or so, <clears throat> their walk becomes pretty normal, like an adult. And then we have preschoolers. Uh, in them, amygdala is developing. So this is the terrible twos kind of uh, period where Amygdala is related to emotional uh, 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 regulation. So they are developing their amygdala. And that's why from the ages of two to uh, up until they go to school, their uh, emotions are, they are learning emotion. And that's why they have all these emotions and they don't understand what the meaning of these emotions are. And that's why they have those tantrums where they keep on crying incessantly and you don't know why they are crying because they don't know why they're crying. And then we have the nucleus accumbens, um, which is the perpetrator in today's presentation. But uh, the nucleus accumbens is the reward center of the brain. Starts to develop in school age, and that's why uh, initially, when you see school-going kids, they really like reward. Even the smallest bit of reward, they love it. You give them like a, like a star on their, uh, on their assignment, or like a sticker, um, and they'll think it's the best thing in the world uh, because their reward center is now developing. And it matures at around like 14 years of age. By that time, you are like completely, you have an adult size nucleus. Uh, adult, uh, the, the development of nucleus accumbens is, is completed by that time. So, so you, you feel reward and pleasure the way adults are supposed to feel reward and pleasure. And finally, the prefrontal cortex, which starts developing during adolescent age group, but it doesn't complete until the mid-20s. So basically, you, you feel all the pleasure, you feel all the emotions, but you don't have the risk uh, calculus in your brain completely developed yet. So just the same things with a little more visual cues. So, so this is the steady benefit that I was talking about. So when you... Uh, develop your cerebellum, you start walking. So this is this is related to coordination. Amygdala is the uh, emotion center of the brain. And then you have the terrible twos and you don't, you, you throw tantrums and you don't know why you're crying. Nucleus accumbens is the pleasure center of the brain. And that's why you love rewards at that time. And then prefrontal cortex, which is associated with risk uh, calculus. Um, that's the last part of the brain that develops. It starts developing during adolescence and completes during the mid-20s. And the, it, basically, it, it shows that you are feeling all the rewards, all the emotions, and you're still uh, trying to understand what the risks associated with certain rewards are. And this is a very... Uh, did someone say something? 
So um, this is a very nice slide that actually describes what adolescents are. So you see that the nucleus accumbens has completely developed to the adult size. This is probably around the uh, around the age of like 13, 14. And then the prefrontal cortex develops very slowly, very slowly. So you have all the pleasure sensing part of the brain completely developed. And then you have the risk calculating part of the brain still developing slowly, slowly until the mid twenties. And this is where the adolescents lie, where they can feel pleasure, but they don't understand risk. This is another slide that I can quickly go through, but basically what it shows is if you give a large reward to a population, and in this, the blue line represents the children, the black line represents teenagers, and uh, the green line represents uh, um, adults. So if you give them a small reward, children, they don't really understand it very well. So their, their brain activation doesn't go up. And adults have a almost a dose dependent response. So small reward means small activation of the brain. And that's why you see the, the, the graph going up here. In adolescent population, they actually hate small rewards. You give them a sticker, they hate it. So, so their brain actually deactivates, starts to deactivate and they stop listening to you. Uh, and, and, and that's what happened with small rewards. But when we move to big rewards, we see that in, in adults, in green, they still have a decent amount of respond, response. The brain activation goes up because they are getting a reward. In children, again, they are getting the reward. So there is activation of the brain. But the black line, the adolescent, look at that. They have the most amount of uh, brain activation with large rewards. And that's why they are always seeking these large rewards or big pleasure activities. Now, this is the pathway uh, through which most of the substances actually affect, uh, impact the brain. Um, the central point here is the nucleus accumbens and everything else basically activates the nucleus accumbens in one way or the other. And, and as I explained earlier, the adolescent brain, because it doesn't understand risk, but it understands pleasure and emotion. So they are primed to actually use substances because they want these large rewards, these large spikes in dopamine in their head. And uh, by the way, dopamine is the pleasure uh, uh, neurotransmitter. So this is actually a very nice study that, that has been consistently being done since 1969. And every two years they survey students. Uh, it's called the uh, uh, Monitoring the Future study uh, through the University of Michigan. And they basically ask 12th graders when they initiated uh, their substance use. So there is definitely some good news that we are better than the 70s, like, you know, mid 70s. Um, um, but but uh, if you look at it overall, the initiation of uh, substances overall has decreased since the 1970s. Um, so overall, less children um, are initiating uh, 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 medicate, uh, 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 Less children are initiating drugs uh, uh, during school years, but they, there has been an uptick since the 90s. So if you compare it to the 90s or uh, uh, like the late 80s or the early 90s, there has been a significant in increase since then. So, uh, and why is it important? Why are we talking about all this that, you know, the adolescents are starting to use substances and why is it important? Like, uh, why is it different than adults? Because we talked about the neurobiology, there is a developing brain as opposed to a developed brain. So this is a scaffolding for a house and the house is not completely created. So if a, natu uh, a natural calamity happens, this is more vulnerable to damage than a completed house. And, and that's the analogy I wanted to give that, um, 
uh, a developing brain is more vulnerable to substance use and it's more vulnerable to the damages caused by substance use. Now let's talk about what cannabis is. Well, actually everyone probably knows what nowadays what cannabis is, given that it has been legalized in Massachusetts, but um, it is uh, it is derived from the flower of the plant, uh, um, 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 cannabis indica or cannabis sativa, and the active compound in in cannabis is THC. Uh, and on your right, you can see a THC molecule. On the left is an endamide. Now this is our body's natural. Um, pleasure molecule in the brain. So um, if you look at the structure of both these molecules, they're very similar to each other. There are some big differences in them too that we'll talk about later, but they're very similar to each other. So basically wherever anandamide works, THC works there too. How is cannabis consumed? So it can be either consumed directly as uh, smoked as the, 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 the bud of the plant or the flower of the plant, or extract from the flower can be used, which is concentrated THC, can be smoked through pipes or in cigarettes. It can be vaped with like ultra uh, concentrated forms of THC, which is extracts from the, the, the flower itself or um, it can be um, cannabis butter or basically like like resin made from cannabis. And finally, edibles in which like you know, cannabis is added to um, 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 edible subs like edible uh, things so that you know it can be consumed. And the only difference is in this form, it's absorbed through the gut, whereas the smoking and the vaping uh, and the, uh, all the inhalant Form, uh, uh, forms are uh, absorbed through the lungs. Lung absorption is fast. You get a fast uh, uh, impact of the substance, uh, but there's also uh, quick recovery. Edibles are uh, um, absorbed through the GI tract or, or your stomach and your intestines. And they actually stay, they, they get absorbed in a delayed manner. So you get that uh, impact of the substance in a very graduated, slow manner. And because of that, people don't know how much to consume. And then they consume way too much. Uh, and it lasts longer too in the GI system. Uh, where is cannabis or marijuana legal right now? So in all the dark green states, it's actually completely legal. So legal recreationally and for medical use. In the light green states, it is legal only for medicinal use. So you need a doctor's uh, recommendation for that. You cannot get a prescription, but you can get a recommendation from the doctor for that. Uh, and all the gray states do not have legislation on it yet. So the, the reason for showing this slide was to just tell you guys that this is becoming very prevalent in the US. So we, we need to be aware of this thing because we are going to be asked questions by our children and, and we need to know how to answer those things. And if it's legal in Massachusetts, why don't you let me do it? So, and then that's why we need to understand why an, an, an adult doing uh, cannabis is different than an uh, adolescent or a teenager doing cannabis. Now, this is the serotonin pathway in the brain, the, the, the red line. And this is re, um, related to mood, memory processing, sleep, and cognition. So the ser serotonin is a neurotransmitter. That's, that's the communication molecule within the, the brain. And it's related to mood, memory, sleep, and cognition, which cognition means like understanding. This is the dopamine pathway. Dopamine, is another neurotransmitter or a communication molecule within the brain. And it, it is associated with reward and motivation, pleasure, euphoria, motor function, and compulsions. And perseveration is basically uh, 
when you get stuck on an idea. Compulsion is when you get stuck on an action and perseveration is when you get stuck on an idea. So those are the things that dopamine does or the dopamine system does. Now, this is a diagram of the brain and it shows all the parts of the brain. The, the pink dots or purple dots, whichever color you're seeing, are the dots where there are cannabinoid receptors, receptors that will take THC or where THC can attach. And if you look at it, it's actually pretty much everywhere. So, so you have it in the cerebellum, which is the coordination center. So you, you, you take any THC and your coordination is off or you, uh, it's, it's not working as it should be, right? It is related to nucleus accumbens, which is the pleasure center, which obviously it is, and it causes that, you, uh, that sense of euphoria. And then it's present in all the prefrontal cortex and, and uh, uh, the cerebral hemispheres, which basically means that the, the risk calculus part of the brain is also uh, um, um, not working well when it is under the influence of THC. Now, why do we have all these receptors? And like, what's the point of, why did nature think of giving us all these cannabinoid receptors so that THC can go there and mess things up? So, so the reason for that is anandamide. I, I told you we, we, are, we will talk about anandamide more. So, uh, so anandamide is the body's own like natural um, jolly, harm, uh, jolly molecule within the brain. So the only difference is anandamide versus THC or delta 9 THC, you can call it either. Um, the, the, the affinity of anandamide for these receptors is one fourth to a half of what THC's affinity is. So THC is very sticky on these molecules, uh, on these receptors. And endamide, not so much. So the example I give is, and, and, and this endocannabinoid system, this system is called the endocannabinoid system of the receptors of, uh, uh, um, of, of uh, 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 cannabinoid receptors is, is responsible for a couple of things. And among them, one of those things is to actually guide the development of brain. So it guides the development of pathways within the brain. So anandamide is like a scalpel. So it's like, like you know, with finesse, uh, trying to chisel the, the adolescent brain into a adult brain. So it helps with brain maturation. Whereas THC is like a jackhammer. So it basically goes there and attaches to everything because it's so sticky and, and it causes euphoria and all the other things associated uh, 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 with, uh, with the endocannabinoid system. Uh, and it actually, that is why it is very detrimental during adolescent age group to use cannabis because there is an endocannabinoid system which is responsible for appropriate brain pathway development and an endomide is doing that job but then you take THC and all of a sudden all of that is out of whack and your brain will develop in a random manner uh, that um, might not be uh, most conducive to to your IQ to your emotions to all the other things because it it, it pretty much actually has receptors all across the brain so now what happens when you take THC Persistent cannabis. So studies show that persistent cannabis users have neuropsychological decline starting from childhood to midlife. And there's this uh, there's this very nice study that was done that actually examined patient um, in in five at five different intervals. So at, starting at age 13, people before they initiated any substance use, um, and then at 18 then 21, then 32, and 38. And basically, the study showed that if you never used cannabis, it, it, it doesn't impact your IQ very much. Uh, and, and you can see that in these bar graphs, it, it, it is towards positive, like that your IQ is increasing, but it's not significant. So it doesn't impact, like if you're not using, it doesn't impact your IQ. But if you are cannabis users for three plus years, 
it has a negative impact on your IQ. So you actually lose points on your IQ. And they, sorry, they categorized into different, uh, like, you know, uh, subgroups where people who never used, um, used but never diagnosed with, I'm so sorry, I don't know why this move keeps on moving, were never diagnosed with a problem. Um, they were dependent for one year, for two years, and three plus years. And actually, it's the three plus year that leads to uh, cognitive decline or IQ uh, decrease. This is an other uh, meta-analysis. Uh, and a meta-analysis is basically a collection of studies. So they take all these small little studies and they collect all the data from it and they make it into a big study. And that that is uh, it, this is a stronger form of evidence. And they found out that uh, um, if you use uh, cannabis, your risk of psychotic outcomes, so basically developing a psychotic disorder, which includes bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and a bunch of other psychotic disorders, it actually increases twofold. So basically, if you weren't using cannabis versus you were using cannabis, you were twice as likely to develop psychosis. This is another study, and, and uh, HR adjusted is what you should be looking for. HR means hazards ratio, which is the likelihood of something happening. So if you've never used cannabis, the likelihood of you developing uh, uh, um, any uh, a skip affective disorder is, I'm so sorry, this keeps on moving. Yeah, so if you've never used cannabis, that's the reference point, and that's why that's one for us, the adjusted hazards ratio. If you have ever used cannabis, like, you know, maybe you used it once or twice, but you don't have a cannabis use disorder, uh, your hazards ratio are still one. So it says 0 0.8, but if you look at the range, it's point from 0 0.2 to 2.9, so it's not significant, which means it is, uh, by and large, it has no impact on, on developing um, uh, schizoaffective disorder. But if you use it 50 times or more, the chances of you developing um, schizoaffective disorder increases by seven and a half times. That's quite a lot. So, so that's something to keep in mind. So decreased IQ, mental health problems, especially psychosis or psycho, uh, psychotic disorders, uh, and now this is a very interesting part, and and that's that this this slide is more for parents than for 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 like children themselves, because parents think that you know well I used to do it or like my grandpa used to do it when when we were kids or my grandpa was kids and he turned out fine or I turned out fine or something like that, but you have to realize that just in the last two like you know like, uh, like three decades I I guess a little yeah almost three decades now uh you you look at the concentration of thc which is the psychogenic compound within uh, uh cannabis it increased from almost four percent to 14 or 15 percent right that's that's four to five times the amount of psychogenic uh uh substance in there and then you look at the amount of CBD in there. CBD is the mellowing compound that counteracts the impact of THC on your brain. That decreased, the, basically, it, it, the maximum it ever achieved was 0. 0.5, and now it's back down to 0. 0.24 or something. So that's why today's weed is not the same as the bead that you probably used to do uh, when, 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 when you were a teenager, hopefully not, or, or your grandpa used to do when he was a teenager. It's a different kind of weed. It's a different kind of cannabis. It's more psychoactive, more chances of developing a psychotic disorder. And this is just like the, the beginning of the problem. Now, the teenagers don't even do like, uh, they, they don't even smoke the the, the cannabis uh, flower anymore, or not all of them smoke cannabis flower anymore. They use vape, cannabis vapes. 
and the, can can someone guess what the concentration of THC in uh, is in the cannabis vapes? They can unmute themselves and say it if they want to. A lot more. Ninety yeah, percent. Maybe like eighty to ninety percent. Yeah, you're actually you're 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 spot on. So it's 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 actually close to ninety percent. In some cases, close to ninety seven percent. So so that's pure THC. So it is the cannabis of today, especially the vaped cannabis of today is not the same substance or the same drug as the cannabis from back in the 90s. So this is a study conducted by uh, our program director, uh, Dr. Uh, Sharon Levy, and, and uh, our research director, Dr. Weitzman. And they showed in teenagers who use cannabis, 27% experience hallucination. So seeing something that's not there, they experience paranoia and anxiety in 33.6%, almost 34% of the, the teenagers, they experience paranoia or anxiety because that's the first answer you're going to get from teenagers. I do it to, to, to ease my anxiety. Well, it causes anxiety in, in almost a third of uh, um, people who use it. And any kind of psychotic symptoms uh, is close to 40 Three percent, so forty-three or forty percent of the people of the teenagers who were using cannabis, they had some psychotic symptom. That's very scary. And this, this is another slide. And the, uh, I must say, for alcohol, it's pretty impressive. But but even for cannabis, it holds true. And I'm gonna actually talk about alcohol first. So what this slide does is it shows that. On the horizontal axis is the um, the age at which someone starts using that substance. And on the vertical axis is how many percent of those people become, um, they develop an addiction for that substance. So in alcohol, if you start before the age of 30, almost half of them will become uh, people with uh, alcohol use disorder. At 14, it's 45%. And the later you start, the later your first drink is, the less chances are that you're, be, you're going to have an addiction for that substance. So if, you, if your first drink is after the age of 21, that's why the drinking age is 21. There's only 10%. It's still a 9%. It's still a significant number, but only a 9% of, uh, of, of those people Will, will develop an addiction for, for alcohol. But the same thing holds true. The pattern holds true for, for cannabis. So age at first use, so if you if you first used at the age of 13, almost 20% of them will develop a cannabis use disorder compared to if you started your first use at 21, which is the legal age for smoking cannabis in Massachusetts. It's legal in Massachusetts, but not for teenagers, only for adults. And if you start at that age, only 4% will develop a cannabis use disorder or an addiction to cannabis. Now, as I said, cannabis has receptors all across the brain. So it impacts your coordination. It impacts your sensation, your movements, your judgment. And it gives you the reward, the pleasure that you want to feel from it. And it impairs your memory. So just for this one purple little thing, you are doing all these other. And this is another uh, 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 PET-MRI that shows uh, the activation of uh, or, or the transmission of signals across the brain. So this is almost like you have sliced the brain from the middle, like where there, there, uh, where there are the two halves. You slice it from the middle and then you're looking at it. And this is the bridge that connects both the brains. So you see, this is a healthy non-user. There's good communication between both parts of the brain all across this bridge. This is the bridge and all across the brain. But if you look at a uh, cannabis user, look at this, how thinned out this bridge is. And even with the thinning out, how little function is left of this bridge. So different parts of the brain cannot coordinate with each other. 
And remember, this is a developing brain. So any changes that happen can become permanent as opposed to an adult brain. So in terms of behavioral effects, you have paranoia, psychosis, irritability, um, impaired short-term memory, poor attention, poor coordination, um, and all these other things. And I'm not going to repeat all of them, but I think from, from the physiological standpoint, you should keep in mind that they can have fast heart rates, dry mouth, and red eye. It can also give you cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. So people who actually use cannabis regularly, they have they they um they start um uh, having intense uh nausea and vomiting and a compulsion to take hot showers. So if if someone tells you that they have nausea and taking a hot shower makes it better, most likely this is uh, canna uh, canna uh cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. And recovery takes a long time, so you have to be abstinent from cannabis for for weeks to months to to start feeling better. And then all the other impacts that we talked about, so poor memory, low verbal comprehension, slower processing, um, worse problem solving ability, and less control over emotions. This is all the impact of cannabis on a developing brain. So definitely is something to be worried about in teenagers. And then people ask about CBD, like, is, is it good? Is it any good? Is it, should this be used or should we allow this to be used instead of uh, uh, THC? Well, the answer is we don't know. We don't know yet. There haven't been large scale studies. Uh, you will see dispensaries selling them and they sell for like quite a markup. So, so their the price is actually 10 times or more uh, or, or, or something more than uh, THC. And someone can correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, and then there's only um, actually one FDA approved form of CBD that is used for two forms of epilepsy in children. There's no other approved versions uh, for any specific disease. And the use of CBD, just like this willy-nilly from dispensaries, actually discourages um, uh, pharma companies to actually research on it and develop actual products out of it that can be used to cure disease. Now let's talk about vaping because I think I'm running a little over time, but I'm, I'm willing to stay back if you guys want. So let's talk about vaping. So this is a study that was done on teenagers. Um, and basically what it shows is in United States, it, it, and this is the National Youth Tobacco Survey. So this is a national sample. So it's generalizable to the US population. Uh, it shows that people who just smoke or experiment with smoking uh, um, uh, during their youth versus people who don't, uh, are twice as likely to become smokers in adulthood. Whereas people who use e-cigarettes um, and uh, du during their youth or experiment with e-cigarettes during their youth compared to people who never smoke or use e-cigarettes, they are almost four times as likely to become smokers as, as adults. So it's quite the opposite. It doesn't help you quit not in the teenage years. And, and this is a statement that's almost incriminating, but also like very important for us to understand. So this is a statement uh, by Philip Morris, their research report. So it is important to know as much as possible about teenage smoking patterns and attitudes. Today's teenager is tomorrow's potential regular customer and the overwhelming majority of smokers first began to smoke while in their teens. The smoking patterns of teenagers are particularly important to Philip Morris. So, I mean, I know how much more I should say about this, but, but, but they are looking at it. And they love vapes. Because I showed you that they are people who vape are four times as likely to become smokers as compared to people who experiment with cigarettes. This is the anatomy of a vaping device. And, and this is a pretty old slide. They've become very sophisticated now. 
but basically the basic structure is there is a battery that runs a coil or a heating element. Uh, and in that heating element or around that heating element is nicotine uh, with some polyethylene glycol uh, and vegetable glycerin. And it's heated up, it turns into a vapor and it's uh, inhaled into the lungs. Now, the, the pattern that vaping companies will tell you uh, happens or should happen or what they want to happen is an adult who is a smoker starts vaping and eventually switches completely to vaping and finally quits smoking. That, that, that was the promise of e-cigarette. And that actually still holds true some European studies do show that in adults, sometimes e-cigarettes can be more effective than nicotine replacement therapy to quit smoking. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that they are more safer. It just means they're more effective in helping you quit. But now in adolescence, it goes in the other direction. So you start vaping first. And then, because that's the first time you're getting introduced to nicotine. And vape nicotine, just like vaped cannabis, is ultra concentrated. So you really become addicted. And nicotine is a very addictive substance. So then when you become adult, so you either continue with vaping or you switch to smoking. And then you add other substances to the mix. And I'm not just making all of this up, I'm not preaching here. Actually, studies actually show all of this that, you know, uh, teen teenagers who vape actually are almost six times more likely uh, to drink and almost seven times more likely to use cannabis and three times more likely to use other hard substances. And what are the inherent dangers of like using uh, 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 vape itself? So it gives you the nicotine. It's not the same nicotine that you get from, from cigarettes. They use salted nicotine. So we don't have uh, long-term studies to show if salted nicotine is safe for the lungs. Um, you get volatile orga organic compounds like vegetable glycerin in your lungs, which turns into sugar. Well, sugar might be very good uh, for your stomach. And that's what they say. Like, you know, vegetable glycerin is FDA uh, um, approved. And yes, it is. And polyethylene glycol is inert. Yes, it is. But both are meant for your stomach, not for your lungs. So if you have sugar in your lungs, um, I don't know how good it will do to you. And uh, it has some ultra fine particles and some heavy metals in there uh, because the heating element is usually made of heavy metals. Uh, and then the flavoring, that's the problem. I think uh, cotton candy, I think it's, it, it, uh, it's actually the, the two most dangerous flavors that are here, like the cotton candy and like buttered popcorn. These are the two flavors that are the most dangerous for your lungs in general, but all flavoring. Like we don't know what they cause. Well, now we know what they cause to uh, de uh, developing lung. So there is a term for electronic cigarette or vaping related uh, uh, lung problem and it's called EVALI uh, or electronic cigarette and vaping related associated lung injury. And 97% of the symptoms uh, are, uh, are respiratory. So you have shortness of breath, you have chest pain, you have cough, uh, or you start coughing up blood, uh, you have generalized uh, weakness, sometimes fevers, weight loss, chills, decreased exercise tolerance. That's the most important thing. And 77% have GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal cramps. And this, for reference, is what a normal lung should look like. Healthy lung. And these are the different stages of Kivali. So you, first of all, one thing you'll notice, all these lungs are bigger than the normal lung that I showed you. It means they're trapping air inside them. And then you have small nodules in A, which is the least, like, you know, severe form of Kivali. And then you have almost like white out of the lung. So air should be black, which means the, the majority of the lung is not functional anymore. It's turned white. So, so the, these are the cases that actually end up in the ICU and require lung transplants.
And, and believe me, we've seen quite a few of these. Uh, and now the most important question, how do I know that my kid has a problem? Well, it's very difficult. Why? This one looks like a hard drive, like an external hard drive. It's actually a vape, uh, like a vaping device. This one is supposed to look like a credit card. I couldn't find the image with the, the credit card actually printed on top, but it comes with a credit card printed on top so that you can't tell. This one looks like a pen. And voila, this one looks like a highlighter. So they are actually, do you think an adult in their 40s or 50s would want to quit smoking by putting a highlighter in their mouth? Probably not. So they, they are marketing it towards your children, our children. So what are some of the signs of vaping that you can notice at home? So you will feel a sweet scent in the air just because they put flavors in there. Massachusetts has banned uh, flavors in uh, e-cigarettes e e or, or vapes, uh, but children cannot uh, or teenagers cannot get their hands on the sub the, the the vapes from from shop anyway so they they get it from like unknown sources and they still have those flavors so you will see you'll feel a sweet like scent in the air like a fruity scent you'll see unfamiliar pens usb devices chargers cards in the room because they they're shaped so that they can be discreet they'll often drink more water because it makes their mouth dry and they'll frequent the bathroom because because of the high concentration of nicotine, nicotine actually causes you to pee. So, so they will go to the bathroom again and again and they want to, to vape again and again and they, they don't want, they can't do it in front of you because, uh, and vaping really makes you super addicted to nicotine because of the high concentration. So you have to do it after a very short interval. So they will frequent the bathroom very much. They'll have some nose bleeds because of dry nose. And they might uh, have a smoker's cough when they're not smokers or a wheeze. And for cannabis, uh, the additional symptoms are red eyes, dry mouth, poor coordination and slow responses, and excessive hunger. And then we also talked about cannabis uh, hyperemesis syndrome, which means if you've used it for long enough, you're going to start having this nausea, vomiting that gets better with taking a hot, hot shower. How do I know uh, that like someone has a substance use disorder? They're not just using or they're not just started doing it or like not experimenting with it, but they have a disorder now and need to be treated. So they will have withdrawal. Uh, so, so first we look at the biological responses. Um, they'll have withdrawals they'll develop a tolerance. So they'll have to do more of that substance than they initially started with. And they'll have cravings when they don't do it. The other thing you should look for is the loss of control. So you use it for longer periods of time and you spend most of your time doing that and you give up other activities that you used to like. And you try to stop it, but you fail in your attempt. Social impairment, is a big thing. So, so you have failure to fulfill your responsibility at school, work, or home. Uh, interpersonal problems, giving up important activities, and then risky use, which is the most dangerous one, which is you use despite the knowledge that you will have adverse physical or mental health outcomes from this. So you were vaping, you had a bad lung infection, or you have you develop Evali, uh, which is the, the vaping related lung injury, but you go home and you start doing it again, even though you you know you're going to uh, get that again. So those are the signs of uh, uh, of a substance use disorder. And if you find that, what if um, um, it says what if I have a problem, but what if my kid has a problem? So the first thing is you see this, this large iceberg and the tip of the iceberg is the part that your PCP can do. And they should do this immediately when you find out or they find out that they are experimenting with it. And this is a brief intervention. So basically they counsel them about the dangers of this and uh, they keep asking them on each visit if they're still doing it or if they're, what the, what's the progress. 
everything of the iceberg under the sea is the part that is the part that requires specialized care. And for that, you have specialized clinics uh, um, that will help you with that. Boston Children's has a clinic called the ASAP program or the Adolescent Addiction and Substance Use Program uh, that helps with these. And it, it, it has to be a multidisciplinary approach. So you have to have therapists, you have to have case co care coordinators, social workers, and uh, psychiatrists, and medical doctors who specialize who specialize in addiction treatment. So that's the 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 the, the part of the iceberg under the sea is the part that. Uh, is done in specialized setting and only done when there is a substance use disorder. And what are the treatment options? I, I heard that was a, a, a question. So for cannabis or marijuana, uh, in teenagers only, not in adults, but in teenagers, and acetylcysteine, which is a antioxidant, uh, its original use is for detoxification of the liver in case of a liver injury because of Tylenol or some other uh, thing that can damage the liver. But apparently, because of its uh, antioxidant activity within the, 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 the brain, uh, it does decrease the withdrawal and cravings from cannabis. Uh, so, so for teenagers only. So, so, so that's one option for, uh, for cannabis in terms of medications. For nicotine, uh, you have nicotine replacement therapy, which includes two things. And usually it has to be both these things for it to work. A patch that provides a baseline supply of nicotine the whole day. And then lozenges or gummies or, or, um, or um, gum or chewing gum. Uh, or any three options is fine uh, uh, for nicotine. So you can, you can put the patch on, it will baseline decrease your craving and your withdrawal from nicotine. And uh, whenever you feel the urge to smoke or you ur the urge to vape, you can use the lozenge or the gummy or the chewing gum. In addition to that, if that doesn't completely help, there are medications that can be used. Uh, so Chantex or uh, Vernicline and Bupropion or Wilbuterin are two options that can be used for smoking cessation. Uh, but it's not just medications that will help you with this. So, so there has to be the behavioral health intervention part of it that's very important. And there are different types of therapies, um, uh, the discussion of which is beyond the scope of this presentation, but cognitive behavioral therapy, motivation and enhancement, dialectic behavior therapy, and contingency management. Uh, and all of these help in actually cutting down the use of substances. Family support is very important. And community support and, and, and community support includes the school system uh, is very important in recovery for someone. So from, from a parent standpoint, what can you do? You can manage, you can provide them with structures because they have brains that understand reward and it doesn't understand risk. So you can actually provide them with the guardrails so that they actually can get the rewards that are acceptable but don't go for rewards that are not acceptable. So pro providing them with guardrails or a structure is very helpful. So uh, privileges should, should only be given if if there is no substance use or like, you know, if the desired behavior is, is actually produced. Privileges include uh, driving, privileges include um, self like use of cash. So, so they can have their own cash, it's still theirs, but you manage it. They can only have this privilege of managing their own cash if they, uh, they, they, they have that certain kind of behavior. And then urine drug testing is another thing that can provide some structure to teenagers. And one thing, one slide I didn't put in there is what schools can do. And, 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 and um, I would say for schools, the most important thing is monitoring bathrooms. Because where vaping starts nowadays, it's almost like a culture, is that bathrooms are community hubs now. So basically, bar bathroom is a place where like people socialize and vape together. And those are people who are just getting introduced to the vapes. Once they're hooked to the nicotine, then you don't need to worry because then they're going to do it at home. They're going to do it at school. They're going to do everything. But if you can actually manage congregations within bathrooms, yeah, I think that's going to be uh, that that can really help with, with curtailing cannabis use within school systems. Uh, and and um, 
yeah so so that's what i wanted to say about that how can we prevent certain these uh, these problems so as i said that recognizing risk factors is very important and early childhood trauma or early childhood adverse experiences are actually uh, associated very strongly with substance use so 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 again those are things that uh, the, that we can uh, probably try to prevent early on before they are teenagers uh, but if if the parents are using substances or if their peers or their friends are using substances that's another risk factor. So you, so that's something, that's something that you, you all have to do together. So if the parents smoke, they'll have to quit with their child, uh, in order for them, uh, uh in a, in order for their child to actually stop vaping, right? You have to provide them that motivation. Uh, mood disorders and any mental health disorders are a risk factor for substance use, uh, and um, favorable substance related attitudes and ex, uh, expectancies. So, so if parents are permissive, they're like, this is a safer thing, you can do it, it's fine. You're allowed this, but just don't do this. Just don't do the hard stuff, right? That's another risk factor for substance use. And once it starts, it's just, you can't stop, you, you cannot decide where it starts. Um, so engagement in school hobbies and extracurriculars, Academic achievements, family bonding, and parental monitoring are all things that can help prevent these things. And um, addressing substance use early is important because it starts with vaping and cannabis and the likelihood of it going to other more dangerous substances is actually very high and very real. Uh, these are some resources that you can actually access later on. Uh, to learn some more things. I have one recommendation for you guys. If if you guys have, I, I have like no financial stake in Netflix or this documentary, but if you guys have Netflix subscriptions, so uh, please watch this documentary called The Big Vape. Uh, and uh, it actually very nicely made documentary. I think our program, uh, our, our, our division chief, uh, she also provided testimony in this in, in this documentary. And, and I think uh, it's actually very nicely explained how vaping industry is actually doing the exact same thing that the tobacco industry was doing when it actually started its boom. So, so we have to uh, keep an eye on that. So this is a good documentary to watch. Thank you so much. If you guys have any questions, I know I went over time. I'm so sorry about that. But if you guys have any questions, I'll be more than happy to hear them. Ali, could you go back to um, somebody said, please show again the slide before the Netflix slide? There you go. Subject. Yeah, you, and, and I didn't stop on this okay. slide for a long time just because you're going to get the slideshow and the recording so you can always like look back at it. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. So, questions? Just checking the chat box and see if there's it looks like uh, somebody is asking for your email or do you want them to give me mine and I can um if anyone has additional questions I can definitely reach out to you with them I can give them my email if that works it, that would be nice thank you so yeah, much absolutely I will put mine in the chat And one thing for parents, now I, I, I just realized that's one point I forgot and I should have written that in the slides. One thing for parents I've discovered over, over the course of like my time and I've seen, uh, since I've been seeing like adolescent population, they find their dealers on Snapchat. So please monitor their phones. So, and, and because that, that perplexed me because Massachusetts had, Massachusetts had very strong laws like you know for like not selling to minors and like i don't think anyone would want to do that like in the adult like to to, to, to buy for minors and stuff but they find their dealers for these vapes that are unregulated these are not the same vapes that you find in stores anyways uh on snapchat and i don't know how because i don't use snapchat but uh, just, just monitor that if you if you know your child uses snapchat yeah I, I, apparently there's a parental 
control thing in Snapchat. I'm wondering if you've ever been asked by a parent guardian to, or, or do you know of pediatricians who are being asked to write, you know, like gym excuse notes because, um, the, the, you know, the lung capacity is so compromised that they really can't do certain um, activity or perhaps they can't, some youth can't do uh, certain sports because it's their, their lungs are too damaged. Oh, yeah, that's seen? one of the most common things. That's one of the most so exercise intolerance. And it, yeah. it used to be thought that, you know, with smokers, it was because they inhale so much carbon monoxide and it takes away all the active hemoglobin from the blood. And that's why they have decreased uh, like stamina or, or decreased uh, uh, exercise tolerance. But that's actually, uh, in I, I don't know, but with vaping, it's the, the lung inflammation and, and all these organic substances, these sticky sugars going into your lung, that that's one of the most common problems that they have is that they have decreased uh, 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 like exercise tolerance and they stop playing sports that they like. Thank you. That makes sense. Yeah. Looks like there's another question in the chat. Aside from NAC, any other medications recommended to help reduce cannabis cravings or to lower dopamine threshold? Uh, apparently, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, no, no. So, so CBD actually has been shown to be helpful with uh, uh, decreasing, for example, the cravings for opioids and stuff. Uh, but it's not actually shown uh, and decrease the, like, you know, or decrease the chances of, of undergoing withdrawals from opioids and stuff. But it's not shown to do the same for, for cannabis. So, so and, and the thing with cannabis is the, the withdrawals actually start after a week or so and they peak around week number three. And that's the time when most of the people relapse. So unfortunately, for now, we only have an acetylcysteine. And for now, it only is effective in teenagers, not in adults. At, at least anything that I know about clinically. What would be the dose? Yeah, that's a good question. So N-acetylcysteine is actually a fairly benign substance, but one, one thing that needs to be understood or like kept in mind is that because it's over the counter, it is sold as a supplement. The problem with supplements is it's, un, it's not regulated. So they put all these other things in there too. So uh, uh, like, you know, they'll put molybdenum and all these like, you know, micronutrients that, that you know, that are helpful to you. But they tell you to take like a, like a capsule a day. But the dose is required for, uh, for, for, for it to be helpful for cannabis is 1,200 milligrams twice a day, which is two capsules in the morning, two capsules at, uh, uh, at nighttime. And if you take those unregulated ones, it's going to cause you to have like, like uh, toxicity for some of these micronutrients. So if you are using it for cannabis use disorder, it should be used, you, should use, you should try to use the prescription ones and you should make sure with the pharmacist that, that it does not have any other added. Uh, and it is 1,200 milligrams twice a day for anyone who wants to know what the dose is at which it is effective. Generally, we slowly ramp up to that dose because it can cause a grumbly stomach and children will, will be like, I don't want to take it anymore. So you give them 600 milligrams just once uh, for the first day, 600 milligrams twice a day for the second day, 1,200 milligrams in the morning, six in the evening for the third day, and 1,200 milligram twice a day, starting fourth day onwards. Let's see. Yeah. Thank you, Ali. Well, I want to be respectful of your time and everyone else's, but um, if anyone else has a question, I put my email right there in the chat, um, and Ali will definitely send me, um, I'll stop the recording right now, actually.